right, everybody, give it up one more time for John Adams. Well, no, thank you all. And it's really an honor. I am not an analog aficionado. Um, even though I work here at Biosphere 2, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a history about it, but just a little bit about uh, myself and my experience here. So I started out in October of 1995 when Biosphere 2 was transitioning away from humans in the loop to more earth environmental sciences under the guidance and management of Columbia University. Uh, so my bias is utilizing uh, this really the world's largest analog uh, for earth and environmental sciences, better understanding the impact of global climate change on these systems. But I'm really excited because over the past 25 years, I've had an opportunity to work with people like Kai Stats and many amazing researchers who are leveraging this remarkable facility to push the boundaries of science. And we've expanded significantly outside of the glass. So we're no longer under the glass, as we like to say. And what I would like to do is at the end, I'm going to I'll play a video that will sort of give you an overview of some of these advancing science initiatives we have here. But I know everybody's here and really interested about sort of the early days of Biosphere 2. Um, again, I didn't live inside. I've had an opportunity to interact with a lot of those who did. Um, but I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of my perspective of uh, sort of what made it really remarkable and what they achieved. So I know we talk a lot about getting off planet, right? But for me, it's really like, I mean, that's a distant vision. And I know for many of you, you're looking at ways to push that boundary. But, you know, we look at it in simple terms, and Claire Folsom, we actually have some of his original bottles here. You know, we've all done this as probably a kid. Can we actually bottle various biological processes up in a soda bottle or a two liter bottle, cap it and make it work? So, you know, I think I did that in sixth grade, seventh grade. And mine turned into a big algal mat. Maybe some of yours worked out brilliantly. Um, but you know, what does it actually take to capture a lot of these processes that make it possible for you and I to sit here in a pair of shorts and a short sleeve t-shirt um, you know, and to breathe the air and not to have anything really special to make that possible? And I think when you start to really drill down on it, um, it's not trivial. And so this original group of biospherians, although much of the headlines was around this notion of a futuristic colony on the moon or Mars, um, fundamentally, what they told me their objective was is to understand Earth systems. What makes them work? And they had an ambitious goal to be able to recreate some of Earth systems and capture some of those processes by incorporating actual biological systems inside of what is Biosphere 2 today. And so they envisioned and actually realized putting in a tropical rainforest, a subtropical savanna, a thorn scrub, a fully functioning ocean system, a mangrove, a desert. They set aside a separate space, but all still within inside this hermetically sealed environment to grow their agricultural crops. And you know, no one had ever done anything like this. Uh, you know, again, I'm speaking to those who know a lot more than I do, but you look at sort of what the Russians did, BIOS 1, 2, and 3. You look at uh, the Chinese Lunar Palace, um, even the Mars Desert Research Institute or High Seas or these others, none of them were the size of Biosphere 2. And they really had an ambitious goal to try to capture these processes. And so they wanted to have an open facility and they contracted with a company called Pierce Structures out of California. These are some of the constructions. But if you look at the, cro the, the cross members that go together, the angles, I mean, it's just a remarkable set of engineering and planning that went into this. Now, I know many of you have probably been working in this field for a really long time, but I want you to keep this in mind that when they purchased the property here, it was 1984. They broke ground for Biosphere 2 in 1987, and they had the first people going in in 1991. I mean, to me, that's absolutely remarkable to be able to achieve the building of this structure. No one, there was no blueprint to do it. To be able to do that in four years was absolutely amazing. And what made it remarkable is how well sealed this structure is. So we're talking about a facility that's volume is 7.2 million cubic feet. So that's 84 Olympic sized pools. Okay, so they put a 400 ton stainless steel liner underneath of the structure. Okay, and it wasn't just 316 stainless steel. All right, it was this su sort of this super stainless steel that they call it. It's a bathtub underneath it. They didn't want any interaction with the desert soil. Then they used a material made by Dow Corning. So this is a caulking that a lot of the viewing windows that we all look through when we go to aquariums are held in place with. So it's Dow Corning 795. They caulked every glass seam around Biosphere 2 with that. There's over 6,500 panes of glass. Now they couldn't afford something like quartz or more of the advanced materials that we see today to let that full spectrum in. 
So the glass that you see on Biosphere 2 today is made up of these three materials here, and it cuts out virtually all UVA and UVB light, but it transmits that photosynthetically active radiation at 400 to 700 nanometers. So it allows the plants to go inside. Now, when they finished and they commissioned the facility, and this is a graph of one of their leak tests that they did inside, this structure leaked between eight and 10% of the published results. Okay, so that's a thousand times more whale seal than your typical building. I mean, that leak rate rivals that of the International Space Station. I, again, for me, just amazing that they were able to achieve that. And so, you know, this is them going inside in September of 1991. So eight people sealed themselves inside. Now, the really unique thing is, yes, they brought a little bit of inventory in with them, but they were going to be completely dependent on the biological processes inside for their existence, not only to balance their atmosphere, but to support their nutritional needs. Okay, and this isn't trivial. So one of the folks that I worked with early on, a really well-known ecologist, uh, his name is Travis Huxman, and what he told me is that as soon as you fold biology in, it mucks up everything, okay? So it's really hard to predict how everything is gonna play out. And that's the challenges that we face here on Earth today, is just understanding these ecosystem dynamics. And so, you know, they had a doctor's office inside, they had a farm area, uh, you know, they had folks who were looking at the analytical aspects of it, the analytical chemistry. Um, you know, they tried to do the best that they could and make diverse meals, but they were limited because of the crops that they were able to grow. Um, they just didn't have a great diversity. Uh, so one of them, and we'll tell you, and actually I worked with a gentleman by the name of Tilak Mahato, so he's a subsistence agriculturist, a Nepalese person, but he still works for the University of Arizona. He was part of the second crew that was sealed in sight. They did a whole lot better than that first crew. Um, and it's just because he was more familiar with fundamental techniques of growing things. Um, and this is a sort of a planting scheme uh, that's published that they had, but one of the things that grew really well, and I hope everybody likes to eat them, um, is sweet potatoes. So we're gonna make you guys eat sweet, pe sweet potatoes for the next three days, okay? So you can experience firsthand. Um, in fact, Jane Pointer told me that if she never sees a sweet potato again, she will not at all be unhappy about that. Um, but all kidding aside, uh, they did have difficulty. So they used a traditional means of agriculture. So they used soil. Now, they didn't have hydroponics. They didn't have aeroponics. You know, they weren't growing insects as a supplemental protein. They were doing very traditional agriculture. And in this half acre of space that they set aside with Inside Biosphere 2, it was extremely productive, um, one of the most highly productive half acres, but it still wasn't enough to give them the calories that they were really needing or longing for because they were working 12, 14 hours a day. Um, this is what it looked like when it was fully planted out. This space looks very different today, um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, again, another sort of life inside biosphere too. They did have a few primates inside. They did have insects inside. They had a diversity. Again, they tried to capture that. Um, but the biggest challenge, and I think we all hear this in the popular media, is that the first experiment failed. And I just cringe every time I hear that, because you as scientists know, there's no such thing as a failed experiment. We do those things because we don't know what the outcomes are going to be. They didn't know what was going to happen. Was it gonna turn into a big algal mat? A lot of ecologists said it would, just like that bio bottle that I built. You know, it didn't work out. But that wasn't the case. But one of the big challenges that they did face is oxygen dropped inside. So, you know, we look at what happened inside, the C over there on the left-hand side is closure. M1 is mission one. There was a transition period. M2 is mission two, another transition. And then it, the facility became more, more of an open facility. But you can see the fluctuations and the variations. So CO2 fluctuated quite a bit, as you would expect. Oxygen went down. Nitrous oxide went up inside. You know, they had methane increases inside. You know, they kept temperature pretty stable. You can see sort of the difference between the internal and the external light. That did have an influence on growing things, as you could imagine. But back to this big challenge, is that when they closed the doors, almost immediately oxygen began to drop. And at day 500 of that two year stay inside, it dropped down to 14.2%. And the medical doctor who was part of that first team said, okay, time out, I can't breathe. You know, his cognitive abilities were being affected according to him. Um, and so they decided they needed to add oxygen in. So that's why you see this big jump. Now. What they didn't do is they didn't disclose that they had that problem, okay? They tried to hide that and they weren't forthcoming. And then when they had to retract some of those statements, we all know what happens to those types of things. It makes it very difficult to recover. And so as a result though, it led some researchers to get involved from Columbia University. And really what they started to look at is what was happening. So 
this facility only lost eight to 10% of its volume annually. We should know where everything goes. So chemists love that because they can balance their equation, but they couldn't balance what was happening inside because CO2 actually should have gotten much higher. And they scratched their head, scratched their head, they looked, they went back, they redrew, still could not get to work. And a graduate student of a gentleman by the name of Wally Broker, who worked at the Lamont Dory Earth Observatory, um, he went home to his father, whose father was an anesthesiologist, balanced his equations for a living, and said, have you guys looked at the concrete? And you'll see when you go through bias for two, there's massive amounts of concrete. Well, that concrete was relatively new. So the CO2 was reacting with the calcium hydroxide to become calcium carbonate. So that's where it was being bound. And for Wally and Jeff and a guy by the name of Michael Crow, who now runs ASU as a president, this was a light bulb moment. They said, we can trace molecule by molecule where things are going in ways that we can't do anywhere else. And we should use this to study fundamental geochemical processes rather than having humans in the loop. Now, I know we can debate that, but that was their, their idea and their philosophy. But this was one of those fundamental cases inside. So biosphere began to transition away from having people inside to what I consider is, it's a super collider for the earth sciences. So we smash atoms together, what's that fundamental building block? The University of Arizona is world renowned for building sophisticated telescope mirrors to look to the ends of the universe, but we don't have an equivalent tool to understand earth systems but everything that you and I are dependent on comes right here from Earth. And those systems, and how those systems change impact our daily lives. And so what we're able to use Biosphere 2 today for is to actually bridge the gap between very precisely controlled experiments in the lab and those field observations we make. We're this intermediate step. It's not a perfect analog, but it allows us to understand some of those fundamental mechanisms, those feedbacks that happen between soils, plants, and atmosphere. You know, they wouldn't have really known how influential the soils were going to be because it was soil respiration that consumed all of that oxygen, okay, and it, or the uptake of the, the, uh, the CO2, the oxygen, and their respiration that contributed to the increase of CO2. The plants couldn't keep up with it. So soil respiration outpaced plant photosynthesis. And that's why you saw that dilemma inside. But again, one of those things that maybe you wouldn't have fully understood unless you had a sealed system like Biosphere 2, and is as complex as it is. So today we're focusing on issues around water. What's gonna happen as our oceans warms? Can we actually build more resilient coral reefs? Um, what happens when our rainforests actually get a temperature increase or a drought? And we're actually growing food on site to better understand co-locating them with renewable energy and how there's a mutual benefit for both. From the start, Biosphere 2 was ahead of its time and through constant innovation and expansion, it remains positioned to address our world's most pressing issues. Biosphere 2 is advancing science within its walls and beyond, as shown by recent upgrades to its infrastructure, biomes, technology, and education programs. The ocean biome is an enclosed system for developing and deploying solutions to the world's coral reef crisis. With a new wave blower, pump, and heat exchanger, the ocean can accurately simulate the stresses and conditions found in natural marine systems. Research is enhanced by the addition of our ocean raceway, a nursery for corals. Here, corals grow beneath controlled lights in carefully monitored water, vital for experiments required before new organisms are introduced into the larger ocean biome. On every scale, Biosphere 2 continually explores new methods of efficiency and control. This state-of-the-art five boiler system reduces our use of natural gas by 82%, taking our campus as a model city into the future of energy efficiency. Of course, our machine infrastructure does not run itself. Enter SCADA. This new platform gives us greater flexibility and automated control over our facility. It also integrates a wide range of sensors into our biomes. Researchers can plug their complex instrumentation directly into SCADA for data to be read, analyzed, and stored. Capitalizing on our improved dexterity to control our biome environments, we've introduced scores of new organisms. The savanna and desert teem with plant additions. Giant clams, urchins, crabs, and fish have been added to the ocean. With funds provided by a National Science Foundation grant, 
Leo will soon bear alfalfa crops for studies regarding the interplay of air, water, soil, plants, and microbes. And in the rainforest, more than 120 new plants contribute to ambitious research projects, like one focused on methane emissions made by tree stems in the Amazon basin. Researcher Joost van Heren is testing out a unique automated methane measuring system in the Biosphere 2 rainforest before it's introduced into the Amazon. Such experimentation will shed light on how natural sources contribute to the global methane budget. Our big questions are not limited to Earth. Our original test module is now being converted into a high fidelity analog for SAM. When complete, SAM will be a sealed human in the loop system that simulates an off world habitat. With an airlock, hub, and crew quarters, academic and commercial research teams will experiment with fertile soil creation, renewable energy development, computer modeling, and crew procedures. Our new telescope array tackles another challenge, how to track the tens of thousands of objects that orbit Earth. This is called SSA. Assistant Professor Vishnu Reddy of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona is using the telescopes at Biosphere 2 and elsewhere to help make you, Arizona, a leader in tracking orbiting objects and predicting their paths. Yet another new asset is the SCC, a joint project between Stewart Observatory and Biosphere 2. With a data center and control room, this facility allows research teams, students, and the public to interact with spacecraft. A 6.1 meter radio antenna just outside the SCC communicates with satellites and other spacecraft and is open to student use, offering skill sets needed for careers in space business. One of the most important missions of Biosphere 2 is to offer profound opportunities to people near and far. The Biosphere 2 Experience app offers guests a tour aligned with their individual pace and interest level. It includes never before seen photos and videos that describe our 30 year history and features a wealth of science stories and interviews. Brand new doors and walkways in the rainforest and desert biomes further expand the visitor experience. A five year grant extension from the National Science Foundation makes possible on site 10 week internships geared toward students of underrepresented communities. Research projects and mentoring prepare students for graduate studies and careers in science. Also for undergraduates is a new 300 level interdisciplinary course. Taught by faculty representing seven colleges at U Arizona, it focuses on earth systems with key themes including data science and modeling, research practices, climate change, and the provisioning of food and water for human societies. We're also connecting directly with U Arizona professors. So instead of us at Biosphere 2 trying to come up with the best way to engage all students at the university across multiple disciplines, why don't we get the faculty who are excited about engaging their students and give them the opportunity to come up with the ways to connect students to Biosphere 2. What we want to do is introduce the students to the multiplicity of natural biomes and microclimates and Biosphere 2 is the really the only place that we can do that in one location. Graduate and undergraduate students alike are served by our VIP program that offers ambitious, long-term, multidisciplinary projects led by faculty. The mission? To inspire the next generation of innovative problem solvers, Biosphere 2, since day one, has been ahead of its time. It's built in a way that can be transformed, and it's built in a way that has gotten better every single year. The world has realized that Biosphere 2 is the place to do its research. Biosphere 2, advancing science here and beyond. We're going to do the Q&A together afterwards, if that's OK. So I'll continue into mine, then we'll, then we'll do the Q&A together. So. My name is Kai Stotz. I'm the director of research at SAM, not at Biosphere 2, maybe in the future. Um, and it is an honor to have all of you here today. This is uh, an exciting moment for us, for all of us in the community, and an especially exciting moment for those of us who have been working on SAM nonstop. I'm going to start off with a short story. So 
I had assumed incorrectly that this conference was going to be another six weeks from now, similar to the date that it was last year. And it wasn't until I think November or December when I was speaking with Jazz and she says, well, we're excited about coming out the first week of May. I said, no, 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 there must be some mistake. It's, it's in June, right? She says, no, it's the first week of May. I thought, oh my God, I just lost six weeks of construction time. So we have done everything we can, pulling a lot of late nights and long weekends to, uh, to get SAM, the space analog for the moon and Mars, um, ready for your, your viewing and, and uh, it'll be ready for teams in January of 2023. So uh, excited to show all of you uh, our, our habitat that we're building just about a five minute walk from here. So this is a double feature. We're actually gonna move into another short, excuse me, another short film that I put together uh, that'll give you just kind of a crash course to the, um, to the construction process that has been uh, going on. So just a moment. So that was a quick tour of, of some of the, um, the experiences that we've had in constructing SAM. And I can tell you that I've gone through, I think, four pairs of pants, at least a half a dozen t-shirts. I've burnt them, cut them, chipped them. Everything's, I, I, my shirt actually caught on fire one time. Uh, so it's been, it's been a lot of fun and a really good experience. Uh, what some of the best, there's so many stories to tell, but some of the best experiences that I've had is watching the volunteers that I have, the team members, um, learn skills for the first time. And so for Luna, for instance, a wonderful volunteer that's been working with us for a couple of months, um, she's had not used the power tools before that we've used. And to see her in particular learn those skills and gain confidence with that ability and now act as a leader for some of our sub teams so she can just take on a task and run with it. And we've seen that happen over and over again. Uh, the takeaway is if you have a daughter, give her power tools in an early stage. <laughs> Luna's actually... 
Luna is actually threatening to sue her father for failure to give her a chalk line as a child because she loves the chalk line. So um, there are on the website, on the SAM website, and I'll, I'll give you the link later, there's over 110 photo essays. We track everything. We have thousands of photographs. Every single week I've published one or two stories about the process of constructing this, partially uh, for our own, our own knowledge, partially to share with you the, the process, and every single story has science integrated into it. We're, we're choosing the paints, the flooring, the metal, everything based upon good science practice of what we actually want inside of SAM when you guys are living inside of there. As low a VOC as possible, fully recycled air, water, and food, et cetera. And we'll go into some of that a little bit later. So we've really enjoyed sharing those stories. And although you might be used to tweets and Instagram and short posts, we haven't had a single person complain that the stories are too long. So I think it's a chance for you to resurrect your attention span and actually enjoy reading more than 128 characters. So what does it take for our species to become interplanetary? That's the question we're all asking, that's why we're here. And although we envision something like this, by the way, a good friend of mine, Brian Vierstig, fabulous artist, you can go to spacehabs.com. Uh, we, we, this is what we're visualizing, maybe within 20 or 30 years, but we're all starting in something like this, with not necessarily this big, but the Biosphere 2 and the experiments prior to that in, uh, in Russia and the ones that have followed since have really gave, given us, as John indicated, an incredible insight to the challenges of both mechanical, physio, physical, chemical, and bioregenerative life support systems. And it's not easy. None of this is easy. It's, I won't use the word easy, but it's easier to be on the space station when you're just 200 miles above the surface of the Earth and you can come back within a few hours. But once we're millions of miles away from home, it's a whole different ballgame. And so as we do, all of us have been to at least one of these uh, analogs, uh, except for maybe the original Apollo astronauts at Meteor Crater. Um, little tidbit, little historical tidbit that um, Gene Shoemaker was the University of Arizona professor who instigated and brought the Apollo astronauts up to Meteor Crater, Arizona. So we have a wonderful legacy uh, with that. So we're helping, your being here today is helping bring the University of Arizona back to the human space exploration paradigm. Uh, while it's been heavily involved in robotic systems for many years, and of course, building the world's largest mirrors for telescopes. So it's exciting for us to see that full circle. So I want to give you just a quick overview of SAM, the, the physical construct. Um, so this is the original test module. This is the 1987 prototype that was built. Um, it, it's the second prototype. The first one didn't work so well and became the gift shop. And the, uh, the second one has a stainless steel floor, as John talked about, that, that bathtub basin welded stainless steel floor. If any of you have ever welded, to be able to weld 3.2 acres it's mind boggling to me how they did that in Biosphere 2. Even the amount of welding within our test module is phenomenal, and they're really beautifully done. Um, we have the similar space frame that's in the Biosphere 2. This facility was used for three years approximately, and the Biospherians took turns staying inside um, by themselves. So I think Frank White would like this one. He doesn't have to deal with anybody else. So they would stay up to three weeks. So Linda Lay, who's one of the original biospherians, lives just up the road in Oracle, and she was inside for three weeks and has told us personally when she came to visit that it was actually one of her favorite experiences in many ways more than the Biosphere 2 itself. Um, and so we actually, when you're down at SAM, you'll notice that we have an N number for those of you who might be pilots. We registered this as an experimental aircraft. Trent did that. Thank you, Trent. And uh, so we are registered on the FAA as an experimental aircraft, and the, and the, the number is N1987B to honor Linda Lay and her time in there. Um, and she thought that was kind of cool. So we have the original test module. We've attached a 20-foot shipping container, which is the workshop, a 40-foot shipping container, which is the crew quarters. The airlock we pulled out of the basement of Biosphere 2 and found a way to attach that, as you saw in the video. And then we took what's called the Rainforest Greenhouse. So during the uh, Biosphere 2 experiment, when it was actually sealed and operational, there was kind of a mini biosphere outside that tourists could walk through, a botanical garden and a simulation of what's on the inside so they can experience firsthand some of the same plants and animals that were on the inside. And so that, that large building to the right is the rainforest greenhouse, and we're remodeling that, rebuilding it as our indoor Mars yard. So we have a 6,400 square foot Mars yard under a covered roof. We have the metal in June, we put the roof back on. 
And that's kind of our technical space. That's where we expect to have a, a, a really finite control of the environment, not temperature, not pressure, but we can keep the sun off, we can keep the weather out. Uh, we're hoping to actually embed uh, uh, PEX line, PEX tubes, so we can actually do rover autonomous rover uh, uh, discovery process of various chemicals and organic compounds. So we could pump methane through one or oxygen through another and have the rover sniff within the Mars yard to find those, not knowing where they're actually embedded within the regolith. Uh, we have a, a gravity offset rig, a, a simulated lava tube, and hopefully some inflatables from some of our aerospace partners that we're working with. So I want to talk to just just briefly um, four phase four principal phases of development. The test model, model restoration uh, was from January through June of last year. We took the summer off. It gets really hot here in the summer, and we just as of last night finished phase two um, in time for this conference. And uh, I won't. You can read, so I'll, I'll let you read those. In phase three, we'll be then working starting in June, a little bit in May, starting in June, working on how we're gonna finish up the ceiling of the living space because we're working with existing components such as shipping containers, no two of which are alike in, in our facility, and then the historic test module. Every interface between those systems is unique. So it's been a real engineering challenge as compared to starting from the ground up where you have a 3D CAD model, you can manufacture repeatable processes and repeatable systems and do this over and over again. Every interface we have is slightly different. So it's been a lot of fun for our team and a big challenge to understand how we're gonna be able to hold a pressure seal against that. We're only trying to go one tenth of a PSI over ambient, but that's enough. You're basically building a bomb. There's a lot of pressure inside of a building when you're at just one tenth of a PSI. Even when you try to open the, the door uh, to the test module under that pressure, it's about you're pulling about 50, 60 pounds just to get that door open. And everyone's ears pop. So it's really amazing and it makes you think. We see all these beautiful images of these future Mars cities at 14 PSI. Are you kidding me? If that thing ruptures, you're shot halfway to the moon. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. So we have a lot of engineering you know, challenges to, un to, to understand before we can actually live the way that we, you know, science fiction has given us. Um, so also we'll be working on advanced hydroponics and maybe soil beds. I like soil beds, but I know hydroponics are the way to go. Uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of our internal team tests. Um, and then in phase four, we'll return to the, uh, the indoor Mars yard and build a gravity offset rig. We're working with Chris Lepps, who was Johnny, Johnny Depp's stuntman for all of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. He knows rigging better than anybody, so he's designing a harness system with a computer-controlled crane so we can lift you up and help you under feel reduced gravity, one-half, one-sixth gravity, as you move through um, our Mars yard. And also a synthetic lava tube, which we're going to be constructing out of uh, 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 concrete so that we can experience what it might be like to be underground on another planet. So we're thinking big. We don't have all the money and all the systems for doing this, but we're thinking big and doing it one step at a time. These are the principal science objectives for our team. This is not your limitation. It doesn't mean you have to comply with these. These are things that we're interested in uh, at SAM and at Biosphere 2 and the University of Arizona. And we, you might build on these. You might come up with something completely different. So we're interested in that transition from physiochemical or machine-based to plant-based bioregeneration, or, or I should say uh, life support systems. As far as we know, it's never been done in a single analog, where you start with a completely mechanical life support system like it's on the space station, and then you transition into a bioregenerative, which means you come into a facility with no plants. You have the seeds in your pockets, you germinate the plants, you grow the plants, and as those plants grow, you're going to rely less and less on the mechanical systems. And if we have an automated application of power to that mechanical system, we should see a decrease in the use of the, of the ECLIS module and an increase in CO2 sequestration by the plants. We wanna demonstrate that not in a model, but in real time with real people. We can do it in 29 days with radishes. It doesn't have to be a six month experiment, it can be relatively short in comparison. So that's one of the things we're really excited about. And it doesn't have to be a complete transformation. We can still have maybe the CO2 scrubber kicking in every now and then, but even if we see that power go from 24 hours a day to just eight hours a day, we've done something. We've demonstrated that function. So and something else that we're really excited about, and I think this goes back to the original Biosphere 2 experience. Even in my own working at SAM, I found my own psychology changing. I gave 22 talks last year. All of them, all of them said one over Zoom. Never want to do Zoom again. And 
if I look at the notes from my, my slides from my first talk to the slides from my last talk, my own psychology and engagement in this process has changed. Um, I'm gonna walk over here so I can look at these people too. So my psychology has changed in the sense that I was really excited about going to Mars. That's all I talked about, going to Mars, going to Mars. But as we were building SAM, and as we really looked at the systems that we're putting in place, I realized that I, like the original Biospherians, was getting more excited about Earth systems. And how, and this is fitting into the, the, the subtitle of this, this, this conference this year, is that as we're preparing to seal this place up and close the air and food and water cycles, I'm excited about each one of us becoming more aware of how we affect the environment around us here today. So I think that as we move to become, you know, to become Martians, we're really going to become better custodians of Earth. And maybe that's a different kind of overview effect. Maybe it's an underview effect. I'm not sure how that fits, but it's, it really forces us to say, hey, we, there is no place to throw things away when you're inside of a sealed habitat. There, is no, there are no trash cans. There's no recycling bins. Everything you bring in stays in. So how can we completely recycle that? And in the back of the room, turn around, there's Sean Gellenbach. So Sean is a PhD student, uh, aerospace engineer. He's worked at Paragon for a number of years. And Sean is working with our team to develop a full inedible biomass recycling system. And we're looking at ways of drying our, our food scraps and grinding it up and feeding it to mycelia, the root structure of mushrooms. So we have a completely closed loop system. And Sean's been become an expert in that in many ways. And he's using three different species of, of mycelia to really close that loop. So we're hoping that we might use crickets in the future. We might use mealworms as they did in Lunar Palace. But we're going to start with mycelia. At least in this culture, I think more people will be comfortable with mushrooms than they might be in eating crickets. But you know, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll trick you into some cricket powder at some point. Um, study of the microbiome, absolutely imperative. Uh, we talked about the algae mats, and we talked about all, we know about all the, the issues of on the space station with these algae mats that grow behind computer motherboards, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, working with pressurized suits, tools, and procedures, um, and advanced computer model simulation, monitoring, and management. So by the way, Trent, are you good to go? Okay, awesome, just a moment, we'll, we'll get there in just a second. Trent's gonna surprise us with an actual pressure test of the suit. So this is CMOC, and we're almost done here, there's two more slides. CMOC is actually why I'm here. So at the Arizona State University in 2017, I was awarded funding to develop a computer-based simulation, a high fidelity simulation of a closed ecosystem, human loop ecosystem called CMOC. And we spent uh, two years with, a, with an undergraduate capstone team developing the prototype. And I now have a seven person programming team, including uh, a recent addition of five people from Arizona State, another computer science program. And we are now funded by National Geographic. So we've developed a really cool agent based model, entirely Python and JavaScript, and it's available for free on the Nat Geo website. I see a Nat Geo logo right there. And uh, we are now moving into our third year of funding. So what this system does is it allows you, the learner, the citizen scientist, to design your habitat. You choose the number of crew members, how long they stay inside. You choose the solar panels, the batteries. You get to choose from 20 different food cultivars, and you choose how many square meters. And then you set your model in motion, and you see if you live or die. And uh, what's, really, what's really fun is that this is designed for fifth graders all the way up to whatever graders. And it's amazing how these young people, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, they get it. They totally get it. We've got classrooms all over the United States that are using this. Um, and the kids are you know, saying their quotes that come out of it are so intelligent. They're saying, oh, I didn't, I didn't choose the right plant, and therefore um, I wasn't sequestering enough CO2, and my astronauts died. Or they're saying things like, hey, I have too many astronauts and not enough plants. Right, and so they're looking at, at the different the relationship between those. So those kids are walking away with a better understanding of their relationship to Biosphere One, to the world around us. So that's how I got here in 2019. I was here conducting my own first plant biology experiment under John's guidance and some of his staff, and just fell in love with the place and said, I don't want to just do a computer model. Let's build the real thing. And so we spent a year and a half raising the money and started in January of last year. So really, in summary, is what can we learn about our home world as we prepare to explore the next? And this is the very first day that Trent Trash, who's in the back of there, the very first day that we set foot. And I remember as we walked down there, I'd been there many times, but there was this overwhelming sense of dread, deep, un completely overwhelming dread. I turned to John, I said, 
do I really have to do this? <laughs> and John said, you signed up for it, better get busy. And uh, this place was, had not been used for over 20 years and everything in the desert had moved inside. Uh, excuse the French, but we, we shoveled a lot of shit. There was rat poo and squirrel poo and dead carcasses and lizards and snakes, and it was a lot of work. Um, and Trent somehow made all of it fun. I was just grumpy and Trent was just laughing through the whole experience. I don't know why he enjoys shoveling that stuff so much. So I wanna just acknowledge the volunteers that we've had from all over the world. Um, we've had just a fantastic crew of volunteers and, and some of them have become staff now. Uh, Luna's coming on full-time as staff uh, starting uh, in mid-May. And so this is just recent, this is just last week. Uh, the gentleman next to me is uh, Grant. He's from Vietnam, he's from Minnesota, but by, by uh, Vietnam. And, uh, and Greg, who's in the gray shirt, just left last night, Trent's in the back. And uh, this is a fun picture and I'll close with this. So the gentleman standing at the blackboard is, uh, is John Z, as we call him, because there's two Johns. He's a former high school physics professor. And so, he, and he's also a former collegiate football player. So what better combination of somebody who understands force vectors and somebody who's really strong. So whenever we need, like we have a nut that won't, is loose because of rust or some pipe that we can't bend, we grab John and he knows how to get it done. So we set up a classroom and he was showing us some fundamental physics uh, just uh, two days ago <laughs> as, our, as our group photo. And so my closing statement is just that we, our goal, kind of our mission statement is to engage research teams from around the world in hands-on scientific discovery and to inspire the next generation to be engaged custodians of this planet while we explore new worlds. And these are the many folks, including Grant Anderson. Grant, raise your hand from Paragon. Uh, Grant. <laughs> Everywhere you go in the aerospace and human space exploration arena, you're gonna run into Grant. He and Paragon, which was co-founded with Jane and Tabor from, uh, from the original Biosphere 2 crew, has been instrumental in helping us. And of course, the ICES conference, this conference, they're just, uh, you guys have done great work and thank you for being creative and, and letting, us, uh, letting us borrow, but really never give back your CO2 scrubber. <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, Trent. So I'm gonna, Trent is gonna be modeling for us. Trent, you're our one-way model. Trent is wearing a fully functional spacesuit developed by Pacific Space and, Aero, and Smith Aerospace Garments. This is the result of a, of a uh, archeologist and anthropologist sitting at a sewing machine for 12 years. <laughs> and I'm not joking. And these suits have been tested underwater. Uh, the original, the, the designer Cameron strapped himself to a lawn chair tied to a bunch of rocks and sunk himself at the bottom of a friend's swimming pool for two hours. Uh, he did have scuba just in case. And these have been tested in cold chambers, in uh, what are those called, those flight chambers where you, where you feel like you're skydiving. They've been tested in open cockpit aircraft and parts of it have been tested at 70,000 feet. These suits are capable of up to four PSI, which is required for, um, we usually run them at about one PSI, which is, which is enough to give you the real sense of it. Everyone who visits our facility <laughs> Everyone who visits our facility uh, will be uh, wearing one of these when they go on EVA. We have two of these suits, and Trent has no issues with being a ham. <laughs> so one of the things, if you haven't worn a fully pressurized spacesuit, it's a challenge. Uh, if you have it at four PSI and you fall over, you're going to have a hard time getting back up again. Um, there are procedures for, for doing this, as Trent is demonstrating. So, so we're very proud of uh, we're very proud of these suits. Trent, are you mobile? Are you able to come up front, or is that it? Okay, that's it. Thank you, Trent. So that's the end of my presentation. John, do you want to join me for Q&A? Thank you, Trent and Sean. Trent was at Ace Hardware up until about 15 minutes ago because we lost one vital part between last year, last year's test of a different prototype and this one. So Trent, thank you for uh, being at Ace Hardware for us for an hour. Hey, so, so a quick question about the biosphere. I noticed that uh, the concrete was an issue with oxidization. So like with Biosphere 2 was um, stainless steel, the solution. And then does chromium like play an effect in like the corrosion with it? Or are we looking at like adding on a different um, metal uh, for biosphere? They recognize the con so the test module 
that Kai is working in had no concrete. So when they did all of their tests, that sort of potential problem, you know, never arose. And so then they sealed it up and it took them a while. So with the construction, what they did between mission one and mission two is they actually sealed the concrete to reduce that interface. Um, corrosion is an issue. So if you go through Biosphere, if you've had an opportunity to travel through, you'll see, I mean, we've got an outdoor environment inside. And so just like Kai mentioned with all the biofilms that the International Space Station deals with, if you have water running through things, um, that saltwater environment that we have inside, we have corrosion. And so they powder coated all of those support members, that space frame strut is what we call it. Um, even with that powder coating, it was still no match for a saltwater environment. So I am sure that they're going to look at new materials that are going to reduce corrosion um, to minimize that exchange interface. Um, but those are some of the lessons learned from Biosphere 2. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're not looking to build a Biosphere 3. I wish we would. I wish we could find the funding. Just as a point of reference, back in late 80s, early 90s dollars, the estimated cost of building Biosphere 2 was $250 million, privately financed. So if we did that today, what, we're probably close to a billion, maybe more with inflation. Um, so I think we can make a really significant go, improve, advance our understanding. But I think societally, we have to convince people to be less risk averse and do those types of things. So I think we've learned a lot. We could definitely use materials um, if we did build something else in the future. And I think, you know, folks like Paragon, what Grant's doing, what Kai is doing will give us additional insight into what are some of those materials that are going to be lightweight, but also provide the resiliency and resistance to some of the breakage and corrosion that we have. And I think I heard your question a little bit different. Were you also curious, like the, the concrete, I should say the concrete itself, the curing process of the concrete, independent of sitting on a stainless steel floor, was, was a significant player in the interaction with the atmosphere. So it wouldn't have mattered if the concrete was sitting on cardboard or steel, it was the curing process of the concrete itself that altered the atmosphere. Other questions? Hi. Yes. Go ahead. There you go. Yeah, so thinking about future space structures, um, we hear a lot about additive manufacturing. If there's any future structures going up as a, you know, in regards to the biosphere, have they considered using additive manufacturing in the process as maybe used in the future for you know, lunar colonies or Martian colonies? Yeah. So I think within, John was just shaking his head saying within Biosphere 2, that's not been a conversation. Uh, within SAM, we are certainly open to that. So because we have an indoor Mars yard that is very flexible, we can work with that. We also have, I forgot to mention, an outdoor Mars yard, a half acre of land that is available to us. And you'll see when you walk down that we've started to carve out a little Martian crater. That's completely flexible space. We can do whatever we want with it. So if there's funding and if there's a team that would like to come and build a structure with additive material, whether it's a concrete printer, um, we're open to that. That'd be fun to try and see what happens. And that's part of what we're excited about is with this combination of our rigid structures, our indoor Mars space, our outdoor Mars space, and inflatables and additive, you know, additive manufacturing, we'd certainly love to explore those different possibilities. I'm Alejandro Garcia from the Dominican Republic, very excited about what you presented. You mentioned that SAM is registered as an experimental aircraft. Can you elaborate about those superpowers or anything you haven't mentioned yet? Trent, I'll, I'll answer. So Trent is a master of, of getting weird things done. And Trent said, hey, he's been through the process of registering experimental aircraft before. He knew the FAA regulations. He said, for $15, I can register SAM. I said, let's, let's do it. So he did. So we registered just the, the, just the original test module. Well, about two weeks after we registered, I get a phone call from the FAA. And they say, Mr. Stotts. I said, yes. They said, this is the FAA. And we're curious about your experimental aircraft. You said it's going to be balloon powered. It's, it's going to be a, you know, under a balloon. I said, yes, that's right. And they said, well, how far along are you on construction? I said, oh, it's done. They said, well, when are you going to fly? And I said, well, I took a deep breath. I said, it's not going to fly. It would take a very, very large balloon. <laughs> and the guy said, well, I don't understand. I, so I told him the real story. I told him this is the historic thing. It's locked on the ground. There's concrete and steel. There was a long pause. <laughs> and he said, I said, am I in trouble? He says, no, that's the best story I've heard all month. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. You're good. We'll never call you again. <laughs> 
But we do want to actually get a hot air balloon attached to the top of it just for a photograph, even though we won't be able to lift it off. I think that'd be fun. Or maybe just a bunch of like helium balloons, you know, like in, in one of the movies. So what was that movie up? Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Alejandro Arroyo. I'm an architectural designer out of Dallas. And um, the software that you're using, or a lot of the graphics you showed, uh, showed astronauts and then the structures. Uh, but I, I do a lot of BIM work and a lot of CAD and rendering. What software are you guys using to simulate this in virtual space before actually building it? Because it seemed like you guys had models that were developed for that purpose. Okay, so you're talking about the actual engineering construction process. Yeah, we're doing zero simulation. Oh. It's old old school. I've got a pencil, pencil and paper and a tape measure, and we do it all by hand. And that's intentional, Par partially because we're working with old systems, and it's easier to go out and just measure it and do a drawing. And I do take those sketches, and then I put them into a very, very rudimentary uh, vector-based program to send off to, for instance, the University of Arizona welding shop. So we do have computer basic line drawings so that we get everything back from the University of Arizona welding shop exactly as needed. The time that it would take to simulate those materials to the exact precision and then build something and then design the interface would be 10 times longer than just sitting down just doing it. And so that's not an aversion to it. It's just the right tool for the right process. If we were starting from scratch and engineering from the ground up, absolutely, we'd be using more computer modeling. So those models you saw are actually by my, my VFX director. I, I used to work in documentary film and I have an artist I've worked with for 10 years. So he, he's come out couple, multiple times, taken measurements and is in the process of fine tuning the model to match the actual structure. So in the future, if teams or architects come out and want to add on or interface something, or if they're bringing an experiment and they want to know, we will be doing virtual walkthroughs. We'll be able to give them complete blueprints of everything, hopefully down to the millimeter. So it's kind of a reverse process, but it's also personal. I'm tired of sitting in front of a computer for 30 years. Like the, best, the last year and a half of my life is the best year and a half I've had in a long time, even though I, my clothes catch on fire. I just, I love it. And I recommend all of you grab a pencil and paper. The kinesthetic function of drawing with the stylus on paper is a completely different wiring than when you work on a computer. It's faster, it's easier, it gets your brain thinking in three dimensions in a very different way than when you do it on a computer. There's nothing wrong with computer drawings, but that doesn't mean that it should always be used. So. Hey, awesome presentation. Super, super cool to see. I, I'm curious, like, how much is Biosphere looking at energy generation? Because um, I imagine on the moon, on Mars, like certainly on Mars, that would be a pretty big challenge is how much energy does it take to sustain life and kind of all of this stuff. So just super curious. Yeah, no, that's a great question. One we get, we get asked a lot. So we're not doing as much as we would like to be doing, but um, let me give you a little historical context. So when the Biospherians first looked for bias for two, you'll notice that it sort of sat in a bowl. It was like an amphitheater. So they had envisioned potentially all of that being solar panels. But when they went back and penciled it, we're looking at like 35 or 40 acres. And then at that time, you know, we're just barely now getting battery storage that really sort of works. So then they really didn't have that. And they didn't have the robustness of an internal grid that could support that. So jumping forward, um, we've got some exi exciting advancements. So we've just been folded into the UA Tech Park, so we're at University of Arizona Center for Innovation. One of our startups here, a guy by the name of David Billy, Solar Space, he has taken a mirror technology and licensed it from the university. So it concentrates the energy in one of his panels. So if you go down on the lawn, you'll see these mirror-like looking structures. One of those mirrors is equivalent to sort of four traditional solar panels. It concentrates it into a focal point where they're absorbing that energy and converting it into electricity on something about the size of the palm of my hand. But the byproduct is that that mirror and that focus energy produces over 2000 degrees Celsius. So he's actually just licensed the technology from NASA for the mission to Venus that takes basically heat, converts it to sound and converts it to electricity. He wants to integrate it into his system. So the combined Efficiency now his is about 38 to 40 percent. Most solar panels are in the neighborhood of you know the optimally 28 to 32 percent. And then if he gets this other one, he thinks that he can push upwards of 75 or 80 percent. So we're hoping to actually demonstrate that here on site. And then Next Era, the largest solar company, they've donated a bunch of solar panels for us. 
we're looking to actually install them. And with what they've donated, we think that once we get them installed, we can offset our electrical consumption by about 70%. So, so two answers to that question. That's the most advanced thing we're working on. And then we're looking to ways to create bias for two more sustainably. But today, Bias for Two loses 50, uses 50% 50 less energy and water than it did when it was historically sealed. So we've done things operationally to lessen our impact. And a quick answer on the SAM front. We're currently on grid, but going off grid is one of our goals once we have everything built and, and running. It won't, it'll be similar to a, a actually less, less solar, or less energy consumption than the average American house by, by quite a bit. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about 24 to 28 panels should give us everything we need. We have super high efficiency um, heating and cooling with mini splits, and going off grid is just a matter of adding another another system and turning off the other. So it's not hard. Uh, hi, my name is Mohib Zara. I'm with the Autonomous Space Agency Network. Uh, I wanted to ask. Um, there was a mention of SCADA and like all the sensors and all the sensors built throughout the uh, biosphere, and I imagine there's a number of sensors go, probably going into SAM as well. And if any of that data is open or using like modern API tools that can be made publicly available? Yes, so, so the data is open. You can go onto our website, um, go under research, and then modeled systems, and you can access the data. Um, you'll only be able to see a 24-hour snapshot. And then if you have interest in data from the biomes, then what you can do is actually submit a request uh, to our research folks. Um, and then you know we'll see what you want to use that for, and see if there's possibilities for collaboration. And you know a lot of times we can make that accessible. Excellent. And uh, other question I had was, I saw there's a number of volunteers you've had. What's a great way for someone to try to get involved with any of this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Well, Kai has been a master. That's all. Right. Show up at 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> tool tool belt on, and and Luna's the new boss. So just refer to Luna there. <laughs> Um, also on the on the SAM side, uh, in fact, when you come on the tour of SAM, we have live CO2 sensors in two locations with some software that we just finished building a new API to our system. So CMOC itself is still a uh, proprietary system. We haven't open sourced it, but we have an expanding team, and we do um, under an NDA allow the local installation of this of the simulation software, the model. Sean, for instance, is using it for his PhD. We have a couple other students, and we just finished this week building a new back end that is not a simulator, but a live data capture system. And that is now being integrated into a database that can be accessed by regression algorithms for, um, for actual training of machine learning algorithms. So our goal is to train the ML so that it can then eventually take charge of CMOC through its learning process and run all of SAM through that same interface. So you'll see the interface when you come down, we have a live, a live feed going. And we'd be happy to work with any uh, machine learning or computer programmers who want to take advantage of that. Chris Kokinos, I teach, I actually don't teach at the University of Arizona anymore, I just, I just retired. Um, and I'm a poet and writer and I've been an analog astronaut and I've been at Biosphere 2 a lot, as John knows. Um, so I guess a question for both of you, but first for John, um, in, uh, in terms of what Biosphere is doing, Biosphere 2 is doing now and might be doing later, is, is, is there any scaling or feeding forward in terms of CO2 scrubbing and CO2 removal that might feed into you know the kind of planetary scale large scale um, discussions that, that we're having now about carbon dioxide removal to mitigate climate change and i don't know if kai if you have thoughts about that as well but um yeah okay so for us most of our work has not necessarily been co2 inside b2 we've looked at co2 fertilization and that impact on ocean or tropical systems for example so we've got a number of papers that have addressed that we're not necessarily looking at advancing, specifically the research at advancing sort of CO2 scrubbing methods now. Kai and Trent uh, just mentored a capstone engineering team uh, looking specifically at that. So I'll turn that over to Kai. Yeah, we just finished uh, a, a nine month design and development of a CO2 scrubber from the ground up. Well, from the ground up meaning that we built it ourselves, but based on concepts that NASA had used. It's a swing bed uh, adsorb and desorb process, and that was funded by NASA. And we worked with uh, some of the leading experts uh, at NASA in CO2 uh, sequestration and, and that scrubbing process, and also with Grant. Um, and so we're still focused on a small scale, though. We're looking at how do we support four people or five people or six people. I think, Brittany, are you still here? Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so Brittany's, Brittany's team is working on a much larger level. We'll be focused principally on what we need inside the habitat. Good question. Anything else? 
Yes. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, so this might be projecting too much in the future, but do you have ideas of how long you want your simulated missions to be and how many you're planning to do each year and who are your target audience for that? Um, yeah, just paint us a picture of, of what your vision is for the future of this program. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, something I should have addressed in the talk, so I appreciate that. We're, we're still shaping that. We've, we've been talking a lot to Shannon Rupert about her experience with MDRS, and I was a crew member in 2014. Uh, we also have Attila. For those of you who have met Attila MD, at MDRS, he's now gonna be doing his PhD at the University of Arizona and Sam, so we're bringing his experience in. We have uh, Anastasia Stepanova. Uh, Anastasia, raise your hand. And she, for those of you who are familiar with Sirius, which is the only hermetically sealed habitat today, functioning today, she's the associate director uh, from Moscow. And she came to Colorado to work on her PhD at the Colorado School of Mines. She'll be giving a talk, I think, tomorrow. Is that right? Excellent. So the answer is that we're learning. We're learning from other people's experience and asking ourselves the same question and saying, what kinds of missions do we want to support? Uh, our first teams will be coming. We have four teams already signed up uh, for 2023. We're hoping to open in January of 2023. So I think we also want to do things a little bit different than the other analogs. And we're focused, as, as I showed you, we're focused principally on these recycling systems. Again, our, our core function is how do we close that air, food, and water loop? And what technology is required for that? And those kinds of experiments could be just a few days. They could be several weeks. But what we don't want to do is become a psychology experiment vehicle. There's enough of those already running, and we don't need to do, in, in my opinion, we don't need to duplicate that. That's not our core function. And personally, I think humans are kind of messed up no matter what we do. So <laughs> no matter how many psychology experiments you do, it's still going to be a challenge, right? Unless you give everybody, you know, sleeping pills. So I think our, we, we, we may be do, we know that we know that the more serious missions are typically one month or longer, and we know that NASA prefers missions that are 45 days or longer. They consider 45 days the minimum length because that's when the psychology really breaks down. That's when your best friend becomes somebody you can't stand. And so we may take those kinds of missions, but probably with professional teams that have already been through that and have been trained for that. So it's somewhere, you know, our shortest mission is going to be five days. We know that. We don't really have a longest mission, but there's kind of that fuzzy gray line to say, let's not turn this into a psychology experiment. Let's stay to the core sciences that we're interested in. And we also, by the way, very careful to state, we're also interested in artists and writers and filmmakers. And yes, yes, Chris. So but it doesn't have to be science. You can embed one, you know, an artist, writer, filmmaker in your team, or you can bring in a whole team of just artists, writers, and filmmakers. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for questions, but they will be around. So if you guys want to hit them up later when you see them walking around, feel free to do so. Um, I think at this time we now have a 30 minute break and then we're going to be meeting back here where we have Grant from Paragon chatting with us. And so, feel free to grab Trent. Trent loves talking about the suit. Go see how that thing works. It's a beautiful <laughs> suit. Thank you.